Hello, and welcome to another edition of Leafless, Not Lifeless. I'm Sharon Benjamin, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always a pleasure to have you listening and watching Leafless, Not Lifeless. If you want to get in touch with me at some point and share your story, you can do so at leaflessnotlifeless at gmail.com. I like to talk to people who appear to have been leafless at some point, but they were actually growing and developing. And I like to talk to people who are helping others to do the same. And my guest today is one such person, Mary Beth Edmonds, who has been in education for 40 plus years, right, Mary Beth? Yes. Yes, decades and decades. They added up and they went by like that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But you are still on the move, still helping people. So that is awesome. Um, again, you know, you actually, in those 40 years, you have done a lot with helping parents, teaching parents, educating parents about how to support uh, parents who have children with special needs. So why so much time spent in that area? Well, let's focus on the word need. Um, once a family starts to understand that, that their child, their lo lovely little child, has needs that might be greater than the next child in the classroom, it, it's, it really hits uh, the family hard, especially when they're first going through diagnosis and, and trying to understand what, what they're dealing with. And having uh, been through that situation myself, I have a son with autism who's grown now, I, I really can be empathetic to say, I have walked the mile in your shoes, not just saying it uh, metaphorically. And so uh, it's traumatizing and it's, it's uh, difficult and, and parents need to know that school leaders, people in the school um, are there to help. And they need to know that they're there to help in um, genuine ways. Okay. Now, can, can we make things disappear and go away? Well, no, we can't do that. But we could pull our resources together and we could target interventions to say, here's where we want to go. Here's how we want to help your child. And here's what we'll do next. Okay. So, so spend a lot of time with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was, how old was your son when uh, he was diagnosed? Well, we, we first started to understand that things were not, he wasn't hitting the milestones, so to speak. Uh, by age three, we started to be concerned. Our pediatrician said, don't worry, so forth. And then we, we took him to be uh, assessed at uh, Hackensack Medical Center. And finally, a little, about a year and a half later, when he was four and a half, we took him to the Brain Institute in Washington, D.C., and that's when uh, he was diagnosed with autism. But but the point there is that, um, you know, he's 40 now. People didn't understand autism 35 years ago. They, they hadn't seen it. And so we were kind of um, punching our way through a paper bag to say, what's going on here? And, and can we, we had to search high and low to get help. What so, was it like? What was it like for you? And I'm asking that because I remember a friend of ours who had a real challenge with, you know, admitting the fact that there was something going on. The daughter was five and was still not, uh, at, at five, the daughter was still functioning as almost like a baby. So what was it like for you, Mary Beth, uh, when you, you know, we, we want all of our, you know, we want our children to be healthy and all of that. What was it like for you emotionally and just the whole gamut? Well, um, th this may be the case with people, but typically your age group will be having babies at the around the same time you are, right? So a lot of my friends and my family members were having babies and I was watching their babies talk and do different things and my child wasn't. And so I was trying to rationalize in my mind, well, you know, I was taking a little more time and uh, these kids are, everybody else was advanced. <laughs> I, kind of, I kind of rationalized uh, for myself. And it, as I say, it wasn't until age three and he still wasn't talking and wouldn't potty train. And, and we were, were struggling with childcare and that kind of thing that I just had to come to grips with it and, um, and get help. And, and that was, um, that became my mission. That became my mission in life. 
he is now an adult. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier, autism was not really talked about, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, I don't know how old you are, but I, I, my age, I remember years ago, people would not even keep their children if there were some issues with them, if they noticed it was in kind of an embarrassment stigma associated with it. That's not the case now. Uh, so what kinds of resources or were there any resources available at that time? Well, that's that's a good question. So at, at that time, and this when my son was diagnosed, this was before the movie Rain Man came out. So Rain Man was, and I use it as a pivotal cultural marker, so to speak, because all of a sudden uh, it was on people's minds. Oh my goodness, uh, autism, what is that? Uh, can your son, uh, can I take your son to Las Vegas with me? You know, that kind of thing. So um, so at that time, let me, let me stay focused on your question. Uh, there was an organization called COSAC it's now uh, the New Jersey Autism uh, Center. And uh, someone gave me that phone number to call. And I spoke with the woman there who was the director, Nancy Richardson, who is just a marvelous, marvelous human being and also a parent of a son with autism. And she talked me through, <laughs> uh, talked me through what uh, I could possibly do. And um, I took courses. I learned how to do ABA. I, I just... I searched high and low, Sharon, to try to say what what knowledge do I need because I couldn't find it anywhere else. Uh, so I I realized I had to I had to gather that knowledge in order to help my son. What kind so, of what kind of uh, family support did you have? Well, um, we don't live near my family, so um, I had a lot of moral support and emotional support from my family. Um, and that was important. They were trying to help us um, understand our new lives because that's that's the other thing too uh, that I think is important. Uh, your life changes. What you thought your parenting was going to be, and what you thought your family was going to be, um, changes. And and uh, reconciling that and trying to understand. Well, what's what's my pathway going to look like? Because it does now it no longer looks like anybody else that's living next door to me. So um, I th people were very supportive of us. Our friend, you know, our friends. Uh, some weren't, but some most were. And um, you know that one one conversation would lead to another conversation, and then we eventually found even autism services in Princeton. And when he was about 11 years old, we were able to get him um, enrolled in that program. A space came open for an 11 year old and we got lucky. Yeah, so how has, um, as he said, when I introduced you, you've worked in education for 40 plus years. How much of what you learned is actually interspersed, intertwined in what you've done to help educators educating educators to know how to support parents of, of, of children who have special needs? Well, that's, um, that's a big leap. And that's, um, I think, I think we're changing as a, as an educational community to think about inclusion more than we have had in the past. Um, I, I think, and, and this is a broad brushstroke, but I, I think sometimes we believe that special education means it's a room by itself with a teacher or a couple of kids. And um, and, and that's that's not a, special education's not a place. It's not a place. It's, it's uh, helping uh, put together interventions so that the child could be successful and access the regular ed curriculum as much as the child can. So I think, I think we're moving more towards inclusive classrooms. Um, and, and I know this is not specific to your question, but my mission now is to create inclusive communities and autism friendly communities, because once once we get into the community accepting this and working with this, we're, we're still going to be, uh, I got to put them someplace else. So, so that goes back to your original thought. Um, 
we don't put these children away somewhere anymore we, we we just we we've come at least a long way since that part that's good as i said before at my my age i do remember how people would actually put them away and i did some work in one um i don't know special ed class special needs class and i do remember and it was only for a brief period but i do remember saying that every child to your point every child can actually learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was somewhat disappointed the way I saw the instruction or saw the expectation or the lack thereof, because um, some people still feel that way. Right. So your mission to help educators educate parents, because I'm assuming Mary Beth, sometimes parents feel that way as well. Yes, it's it's um, it's challenging to change mindsets, as you as you know, and I and I really hate to use the word mindset because it's it's so cliche at this point. But um, but I, I think the key is to talk about inclusion and talk about ourselves as a society to say everybody belongs. I think that's a it's, um, I think that's an accessible way to speak to teachers, to speak to parents, to say everybody belongs, and we we can't really uh, exclude because we think uh, somebody's not thinking or understanding because they can't speak or they can't communicate. That that just means we we can't understand what they have to say, but it doesn't mean that what's going on here we have no idea, right? A lot can be going on there, so. Um, so again, it's it's my mission to uh, communicate, talk about it all the time, and and to build what I hope is a autism friendly society. And we'll see we'll see where that goes. So so yeah. that's why I may be leafless, but I'm not lifeless. <laughs> exactly. And and you are, as I said in the beginning, you're actually helping others because you can actually see the potential. And I think if I'm saying correctly, you're helping educators and helping parents to see that in spite of what we see on the outside, there are abilities, there are things that uh -huh. people mm -hmm. can do. And I want to share a picture here. You can talk about it a bit because uh, some of your work with with the children, I believe, uh, yes. let's see, this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's Spots, and Spots was our mascot, and I would take Spots around school with me uh, physically, and kids love puppets. Every kid loves the puppet, let me tell you, uh -huh. and I would, I would put Spots on um, on the Zoom calls with me, and uh, and the kids would interact with Spots, and, and even if they couldn't talk, they would throw him kisses, and Spots would throw kisses back at him. And, and the notion, again, that um, we care for you, right? We're communicating that we care about you and you're important to us and you belong. And so um, a good deal of my work uh, was interfacing with uh, children with the puppet. And, that, and that, works, that works with a lot of kids. So I want to know, kind of run us through a scenario of your, an initial presentation to educators. Okay. Okay. So um, let's start with uh, one in 44. Let's, let's just start with that. Uh, one in 44 is the current uh, estimate of how many children are currently diagnosed with autism. And that's the estimate that the CDC has uh, projected in their 2021 um um, results, their, their data collection. When my son was diagnosed back in 1987, uh, the estimate was one in 10,000. So, so think about that jump, think about that leap, one in 44. So if you're in a building, right, with several hundred children, one in every 44 of them is probably diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So so here it's it's here and it's it's around us and and it may not it may not look typical and by that I mean um 
every child who's diagnosed with autism probably doesn't look like the next child. So you can't, can't really see it the way you might see someone in a wheelchair. So it's kind of, a, oh, it's almost an invisible kind of a, a neurological disability. So I, I would start with the number. I would also start with some pictures about what disabilities look like. And of course the autistic child just looks like everybody else, right? So, so, so that's the kind of presentation that I, I would begin with. Um, I would also talk a little bit about some of the main features where um, a uh, professional would start to look, and that would be the social and communication difficulties, challenges uh, with um, disruption in the routine, because that's that's another key marker. Uh, children and adults with autism um, need the routine and and stick to the routine. And when that routine is interrupted, uh, it it causes challenges. And then uh, the last part, of course, is um, repetitive behaviors. So so those would be the key points that I would talk about with teachers and with parents, so that they would they would understand. I'm thinking. But I, I think the numbers are pretty powerful, right? Yes, exactly. And I think that um, perhaps y you would know better, but I'm guessing that, you know, years ago before there was a real understanding, people just considered kids with autism to be disruptive in class or to be not listening or any of those other um characteristics or uh -huh. traits or if that's those are the correct words and just not knowing what to do with them right it was, it was probably the entire school or the entire uh you know educational population edu as educators correct and, and it could have been you're right emotionally disturbed might have been a diagnosis mental retardation uh, childhood schizophrenia. I mean, those are the kinds of um, labels which um, are limiting. And we can have a whole conversation about labels at another time. But those were probably the labels that might have been assigned um, to children who showed some of these um, symptoms. We'll call them symptoms for, for the conversation here today. Yes. So uh, Mary Beth, you, stored, you started an organization. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, a few years ago, uh, we launched the New Jersey Autism Think Tank, and we were bringing together a group of uh, committed stakeholders, parents, uh, educators, um, employers, um, college professors. We, we were pulling together a, a whole group of people to talk about becoming an autism-friendly New Jersey. And, and um, because, because here's the thing, Sharon, every, every child you meet who's diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder is going to grow, grow up to be an adult with ASD. So, um, so all of these children now <laughs> are going to perhaps want to go to college or go into the military or uh, seek employment. And so are we ready for this? Uh, and I'm going to say no. I'm, I'm going to say no, we're not ready for that. So uh, this month, well, October, actually, uh, we're going to have our kickoff meeting. I've got a great group of people coming together to um, reboot the New Jersey Autism Think Tank. And again, my mission is to bring together people to say who's, um, who's got expertise in autism in this state and connect them because, you know, for example, people in Felician University have a research center for autism. And they're not connected to Eden Services in Princeton, and they're not connected. They're 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 operating um, Silo. uh, silos exactly. Mm -hmm. So so it's kind of it's it's kind of like the it's kind of like the moonshot um, approach. You bring all your resources together and and put them together, and and then you see where it goes. So I'm very excited about that. Is that part of the? Uh... Uh, Edmonds Out Enterprises? Uh, not exactly, but okay. uh, Edmonds Out Enterprises will be working as a, you know, as a consultant to help um, schools and families. So um, I, I'm basically um, 
working as as an independent volunteer for that group, not necessarily my consulting firm. However, okay, however, <laughs> it all works. It all works, right? Yes, yes. So mentioning volunteer, you you have time to volunteer. Yes, yes. Um, uh, October first, we have a team. Uh, that's going to be uh, walking in the Eden Autism uh, Fun Run. And so far we've raised $5,700. Our team is called Make a Difference. And um, Eden itself has raised over $100,000 for, um, for, the, for the walk. But our team, uh, I'm really proud of that. <laughs> we raised $5,700, our little team. But we're the Make a Difference team. So, you yeah. know, we're... Uh, we're out there. And then I'm also uh, chair of the gala. And uh, last year, um, we raised uh, over $175,000 at our gala. And I'm working on the gala again for next January. And then um, in addition to my former work on the board of trustees for Eden, I'm now the chair of their aging and medical needs committee. And so what's what's happening there, Sharon, is that um, uh, some of our participants are in their 70s, closing in on 80s, and we are developing um, programs and strategies to help them because they need hip replacements, knee replacements, they have heart disease. I mean, they're aging and the way the normal population does, yeah. right? So yeah. how, how do we have doctors and rehab centers uh, work with our guys and gals and try to understand that they're dealing with a a patient with autism and and here's some of the things we can do. So we're we're scratching the surface on that, but I must say I'm very proud of that work. That work is moving forward and it's um it's very exciting work. And I think people are going to learn from us because it's not it's not happening anywhere else. I like that idea. And you know, I most the general population, I'm sure, does not think about the fact that people with autism are going to age and have the same issues, health issues. Right. That- the rest of the population has right, right. But, you know lose a tooth need a bridge you know yes. every, every all everything you know everything from soup to nuts so so our our uh, main thrust is to keep our autistic population active healthy and engaged through their later years but like everyone else um and 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 the the other thing to Sharon realistically it's called aging and medical needs but a, a young person could have serious medical needs you don't have to be 70 exactly eight. but i think it's a great thing that you're looking at the um those who are aging because as i said i'm thinking and you would know better that most of us don't think of um anyone with a disability uh-huh. aging and, and right. considering the fact that whatever health issues any one of us can have, they have as well. Right. And if they get dementia, I mean, how are we going to know? I mean, that's that's another thing that the medical community doesn't even know yet. They don't know. How, how would you tell if a, um, a person who has a neurological disability is developing dementia? And yeah, you that. you also contributed to a book, Mary Beth. Tell yeah. us about that. Let's see if I, yes. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Things I Wish I Knew. This deals with um, being an educator. And um, I was invited to participate in uh, developing a chapter for this book. And, um, and what I chose to write about was my experience being an educator uh, when 9-11 happened. And I don't know if you were still working in school. Um, yes, I was. Do you remember that day? I bet you I remember, do remember it. I, I bet you remember everything about I it. I remember it, I do. <laughs> and so I, I wrote about um, being called to serve that uh, in, a, in a blink of an eye, right, at a quarter to nine, whatever time that was, where, you know, the buses are coming in and kids are getting off. It was just right at the beginning of the school year, right? And we're, we're just doing our daily work and getting kids ready to have their morning meeting and, and kick off the day. And then in a flash, it all changed. And, and I wrote about um, trying, you know, what our, what our teachers did, what our guidance counselors did, 
how the school leaders came together with our community leaders and our clergy and, and how that day not only affected um, the district because we did rise to the occasion that day, but how it impacted me personally. And, um, and I think we, we changed um, after that day for sure. So uh, I was happy to, um, to write about that. And um, I certainly didn't know <laughs> how we would respond. I don't think anybody did. Exactly. I don't think so. Well, that, that is awesome. Uh, Mary Beth, thank you so much for being with me. This is great information, educating the audience, because so many people have different ideas about what autism is. Uh -huh. Is uh -huh. it autism? Is it autistic? What is it? How do you right. handle? How do you just live with someone with disabilities? When you see them, what do you do? What do you say? Uh -huh. so thank you so much for educating educators to help parents. And once the educators help parents, it just spreads and people have a better understanding. How can people reach you? Uh, they can uh, reach me through uh, my uh, website, which is www.edmondsout.com. They could also reach me um, at my email address, which is marybeth.edmonds at gmail.com. So uh, those are really the best way to, ways to reach me. You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. MB Edmonds. I, you know, I'm, I'm on uh, social media quite a bit. And, um, and, and uh, you know, lastly, uh, Sharon, I, I do want to say when my son was diagnosed, the neurologist told me that he would probably be the only person I would ever meet in my lifetime who has <laughs> autism. And now I would venture to say everybody I know probably knows at least one person. Exactly. Who's been diagnosed with autism. So the world changes and we we build understanding through knowledge. So you're I, absolutely I agree. Right. I agree. In fact, I'm thinking of a grandmother whose granddaughter has autism. And the grandmother even said to me that, you know, I think I had some of those. Uh, traits and she was even wondering about herself so thank you so much for educating us this is awesome oh. so thank, thank you so much for those of you watching leafless not lifeless I'm Sharon Benjamin your host if you have a story that you'd like to share I'd love to hear from you you may contact me at leafless not lifeless at gmail.com leafless not lifeless at gmail.com thank you so much for listening and watching and maribeth again thank you so much for being my guest on this edition it's my pleasure thank you sharon